Amen. It's stirring people. Amen. Y'all believe God can still stir people? Amen. I remember when I was living out in sin. Anybody remember when you was living in sin? <laughs> Amen. I remember living out in sin, and there'd be times that I'd be, I'd be on the road, be, uh, be running up and down the road. I used to uh, remove asbestos for a living. I used to travel a lot, go different places. Growed up in church, mom and daddy pastor in church, and growed up in a Pentecostal church. Y'all think we're crazy now? Y'all ain't seen nothing what I growed up in. I mean, I'm telling you what, Pentecostal to the bone, praise God. And I know, and I know that uh, mom and dad would always be praying. And, uh, and I would pass by little churches uh, driving, going from place to place. And I'd not be where I needed to be. And no, I wasn't where I needed to be. Be completely away from God. But I passed by little churches sometimes. And, and I would see the little signs that they had on there. I'd see the name of the church. And I'd get convicted. And, and I would say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Even though in my mind I didn't have intentions of helping myself, I still knew that God was a big enough God he could help. And I think what we're living in today is a society that here's the thing, that we have hyped up church to a certain extent that we haven't really had a personal relationship with him. There's a difference between just coming to church and being churchly. Come on, somebody. I mean, I'm a professional churchgoer. I go every Sunday and every Thursday. Come on now. I mean, when it comes to a professional, I mean, I'm 25 years in the ministry. And, and I mean, when it comes to being professional about it, I can do it as good as anybody. And when you've been around it long enough, sometimes you adapt to what's going on around you. But when you have a relationship with Christ, you have that true identity of him living on the inside of you. And I believe that this revival that is happening right now, that's what God's doing. He's calling his church people. Amen. Matter of fact, he's, he, he's stepping outside of the church and he's going into the bars into the nightclubs. Come on, somebody. He's going into the abortion clinics. He's going into the prisons. Come on. And he's calling people, and, and, and they are seeing a call of revival like we've never seen. There, this is a generation you will not be able ever. You have never seen a church that God is building because we can never describe. We can look back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and we can look back to all the movements and we can see, well, this is how God did it. This is how God did it. But in this generation, he's doing something completely different. He's doing something that the church has never seen. Come on now. He's going past what we've read about. He's going past what we think we know about it. And the spirit of revival is moving. It is a fire. It is moving inside of us, and it is causing men and women to absolutely come to the throne room of God and fall down at a living God and admit, I am lost. I need you. I want you. I'm giving up everything about me. I don't need my identity no more. I want the identity of Christ inside of me. God is moving and a revival is stirring. Look at your neighbor and say, he's going to preach to you tonight. I want to talk about, uh, there's a book uh, that I read several years ago and, and I've been reading it for, for uh, many years and it's a book that an author by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. Anybody ever heard of Leonard Ravenhill? It, 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 it is a book that, that he wrote. I mean, he wrote a, a book entitled Revival God's Way, and he wrote a book also entitled Why Revival Tarries. And, and uh, just the title itself is a sobering title. I mean, why does revival hang around? What is it about revival that hangs around from one generation to another generation to another generation? What is it about revival who, that, that, that absolutely keeps hanging around? Revival is a spirit. It's a spirit released from heaven, and it is a spirit that moves upon the church. And, 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 and what it does is it revives us. Come on, somebody. You, you probably didn't know you could uh, be dead and go to church, did you? <laughs> Some of those dead churchgoers. Praise God. I remember I used to go out and I used to preach in different churches. Amen. I'd, it'd be so cold. I mean, go in there and I'd stand up and I'd, 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 I'd preach. And I mean, it'd be, I mean, that'd it, be like it. 
I mean, people been going to church all their life. They are like, oh, preacher, you can't say nothing I ain't never heard. You ain't going to move me. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I remember we was at a church in Savannah, Oklahoma. Anybody know where Savannah, Oklahoma is? Amen. If, if you've ever went uh, to Texas and hit Highway 69 right out of McAllister, uh, you come into a little town called Savannah. It's right on the highway. And there's an Assembly of God church there. And the Assemblies of God is an organization that formed in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, after the fact that the Holy Ghost broke out in Topeka, Kansas, and began to move. And then there was a movement of Holy Ghost movement. And so, and so there was a, uh, a, a argument in the church. Imagine that. Church people arguing. Argument in the church. And they decided, we need to assemble together. And so they assembled themselves together and become an organization in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. But they noted that the church that started in Galena, Kansas, that used to be at the Assembly of God, there they've changed it now, I think it's the Pentecostal Church of God, but the church that was in Galena, Kansas, the Assembly of God, they noted that it was one of the very first on the road. Did you know that right here, listen to me, we're on breeding grounds of revival. This is the birthing grounds. This is it. We're absolutely, this is what God wants for us. And so they made note that the one in Galena, Kansas, would be the very first one on the roads. And so the Assemblies of God begin to start up, and they're probably the, the uh, biggest of the uh, Pentecostal movement and uh, as far as uh, organized and, 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 and big and stuff. And, and so the Assemblies of God, uh, started and and so and so I was uh, asked to come and preach a revival at this Assembly of God Church and I was excited because I have an uncle that raised a man from the dead in the church and I've been hearing stories about this all my life. Yeah, you remember when your uncle that time went to church and and old so and so died and he walked up and he just laid his hands on him and and raised him from the dead and it took that church that was a dead church and I mean it become a live church. And it was a thriving church, and people would come all around, all over the place. People would come from everywhere just to come to the church so that they could sit in a seat where a man died and got raised again. Come on, somebody. And so, and so I was excited because I was going to get to go to that church. Me and Anna, man, I mean, I, I was pumping Anna up. And I, tell, I mean, Anna's raised Baptist, and she's still kind of set back a little bit. But I was pumping her up, and I was telling her, man, these people are crazy. They're going to run up against walls. I mean, they're going to fall down. I, I mean, they're going to get holy and roll, praise God. I, I mean, because they're called holy rollers. I, and they're going to roll all over the place, and things are going to happen. I, and, I mean, I'm telling you, it's going to be a shucking buck fest up in this place. I, we're going to get up there, and we're going to see this thing happen. And we got in there, and I mean, lo and behold, the piano was tuned to like a 430, I think. And so, and so Anna's usually singing all of her songs. I mean, I'm, I'm usually the instruments are, are, are tuned to 440. And so, and so it, it's like a 430 or something like that. And so she's having trouble, you know, trying to figure out and trying to get in different keys and stuff. And I mean, it's like, it's like a hindering thing. But because when the, when the worship team is hindered, everything gets hindered. So I was sitting in the back and I was praying. And I was sitting back and I was watching everybody go. Listen, listen, listen. Oh, let me do it like this. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back and I'm watching this. And I mean, Anna's saying, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm just like, man. Alive. Lord, what in the world? And God spoke to me. And this is what he said. He said, they've hung around it so much that they think that they've uh, experienced everything that they're ever going to experience. They've hung around it so long that they think that this is all that there is going to happen. And what happens in the church world today is sometimes we get so used and we come and we just uh, get so used to sitting and just hearing and doing. And what God is going to do is he's going to take this revival in this church 
not this church, well, yeah, this church, but other churches around, they are going to feel that there is a power that is bigger than them. Come on. There's a power that is bigger than religion. It is going to move. It is going to shake people, and they're going to experience things that they've never experienced before. Most people like to wait till they get to church and think, well, I hope the singer sings and the preacher preaches uh, so I can feel God, praise God, uh, because I just need God. Uh, but the thing about it is, is God is setting a revival uh, that when you get up in the morning, uh, that before your feet hit the ground, uh, the devil's going to say, my God, he's woke up again. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm telling you what, there's revival uh, that is stirring the church uh, that when you walk into Walmart, uh, they're going to look at you and say, my God, what do you got uh, all over? Over you. You're going to be driving down the road and drunk people that's strung out. My God, I'm about to shuck and buck already. And drunk people that are drunk on alcohol and drunk on drugs and drugged up. They're going to feel the anointing in your car while you drive down the road. And they're going to say, I want what they got. <laughs> Hallelujah. You mark my words. We're thinking we're going to experience some survival inside of a building uh, with a group of people, uh, and the singer's going to sing, uh, and they're going to get together, uh, and they're going to preach, and we're going to feel God. Uh, but God's saying, I'm going to do something in this generation uh, that no other generation has seen. Uh, he said, I'm going to take the true worshipers. Uh, I'm going to take the true seekers, uh, those that are seeking me, uh, those that want to know the truth, uh, because the truth uh, will set you free. Uh, and the truth is a person. Uh, it's not a word. Uh, it's a person. Uh, and they shall know the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus Christ. As he comes, as he comes with the word, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Hallelujah. Well, I'm a believer. Well, so is Satan. He believes there's a God. We got to get past the believing part and get into the seeking part. Woo. The true seekers. Amen. So when I was going through this parable here, I was going through this and I was reading and something struck out to me as Jesus began to talk about uh, this parable. Matthew chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, turn me to Matthew chapter 20. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 20. Has anybody ever seen anybody in a race and they give the prize to the person that come in second? It's always kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's always like, hey, I'm number one. Well, I'm number two. <laughs> What's that got to do with it? Well, he's number one. I'll just be number two. I like the number two. I like the blessing. It's called the blessing for the power of the second. And that's something sometimes that we don't understand. But there is a, a blessing for the power of the second. And as God begins to move, in Genesis, this is what God says in Genesis. The Bible said that when he created the first day, he said, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Now get this, when you go to the book of Genesis, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Now in our accounts, we would say the morning and the evening's the first day. But God's going backwards and saying the evening and the morning is the first day. Hmm. I wonder why. Well, let me just tell you, because God does his best work in the dark. Come on, somebody. Ain't you so glad that when it got dark on you, God didn't leave you? Ain't you so glad when all your friends walked away from you, they couldn't handle your mistakes, they couldn't handle your stuff, and it got dark, God came in the picture, and he, he moved on your life in a dark place. He does his best work at night anyhow. He does his best work in dark places. Isaiah says that out of the darkness, out of the darkness comes the treasure. Out of the darkness will he reveal treasures in our life. And sometimes, my God, I can't even read my text yet. Sometimes, sometimes when we look back in the worst place we've ever been in our life is one of the greatest testimonies that God has given us. And sometimes the worst things that we've ever went through, God is saying, I'm going to help you through it because I'm going to make this a stepping stone in your life. Other men 
will not be able to trip over this, but they will stop in the middle of it and see that the power of myself was upon your life. And when you got God's power on your life, things begin to change. Hallelujah. I hope y'all got time for me tonight. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20. If you got your smartphones, your tablets, your old fashioned Bible, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 20, <laughs> verse number one. Jesus said, Now I'm going to read out of King James Version. If you're used to reading out something else, it'll. Probably parallel and sound about the same anyway, besides the dust and the D's and thou's. And. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is in an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, now hang on just a minute. Now, you know, this was a long time ago to work for a penny a day. My grandpa used to talk about, yeah, you know, we'd go out there and we'd work for a dollar a day. And so we'd have kids and send them out there, and they'd work for a dollar a day. If you had five kids, you got $5 a day. And talk about working for a dollar a day, I mean, I mean, you can't even. So we know this was a long, long time ago. But in their time, it said he sent out a man, and he worked, and 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 uh, they agreed to work for a certain wage, which was a penny a day. So he sent them into his vineyard. Next verse. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle, in the marketplace, and he said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right. I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, it's getting close. Look at your neighbor and say, it's getting close. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. <laughs> Listen. Isn't it amazing how, how we say, you know, we, we uh, uh, walk in, you know, I'll just put Mad Dog for an exi- uh, example. He went to 505 down here one day, and he was standing there in front of the door. Everybody walked in. He said, hey, you know Jesus? <laughs> and finally, the owner asked him if he would please step outside. Yeah. <laughs> but see, Mad Dog seen people standing idle. Isn't it amazing how we can see people standing idle around? Oh, we know they have problems. We know they have issues. And we think, well, you know, we just don't want to be abrasive. Or, you know, we don't want to be rude. Let me tell you something. I don't want nobody running through hell hollering out my name. Saying, Roger Brown, why didn't you tell me the truth? Roger, why didn't you tell me that hell was real? Why didn't you tell me that this lifestyle that I'm living is real? I don't want nobody to come in contact with me and say, he's a good old boy, he loves God. I want them to know that when I step into the picture and if God moves upon my life, I'm going to talk to them about where they're at in life. And we have got to understand, we are in the 11th hour and it's time to quit standing around and wondering if anybody's going to like you or not. I don't care if I make another friend again. I need to tell you what God said. He's a living God and he's soon coming back and we better get it right. <laughs> they say unto him, because no man hath hired us, he said unto them, go you also into the vineyard whatsoever is right, that ye shall receive. So when even was come, The Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. (coughs) Now that would make you mad, wouldn't it? To be there all day and then have to wait in line because some yahoo got there an hour? I mean, they didn't get the work gloves on good enough. Now they're going to stand in line and get their money first? Now I've been here... (laughs) 
It's called the spirit of entitlement if you haven't understood that that's what we're living in today. People always think that they're entitled to something. They don't want to be honest about it. They don't want to work for it. They want to cry about what everything's going wrong, about how their life ain't right, about how everything went crazy in their life, and they're blaming everybody else. Well, I'm like this because Daddy was like this. I'm like this because, you know, that's how I was raised. I'm like this because nobody this and nobody that. But can I tell you something that I can tell you right now at 706 North Broadway in Pittsburgh, Kansas, that when people walk into this place, we will tell them that no matter what it was in your life, Jesus will change everything about you, and it's time to start getting it right. I'm already sweating. I ain't got started on my scripture yet. And when they had come, they were hired about the 11th hour. They received every man a penny, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Whew, I like that. It is not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own. It is thine evil because I am good. So the last shall be first. I'm getting to it. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, listen, but few are chosen. But many be called, but few are chosen. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I mean, I mean, boy, that's kind of bad of God. You know, I mean, we're all called, but he's only cho chosen a few. I mean, where does that lead God? One scholar said it like this, many are called but only few choose. Many are called but only few choose. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, and I thank you for this power, this spirit of revival, as it begins to move all over this place. I ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you begin to move from the top of this building to the bottom, and from the side to the side, and the front to the back, that you leave nobody or nothing undone. I ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you begin to move, that your power begin to move in this place, that when they walk out of here, they can't say, well, I've never heard a preacher like that, but I want them to say, I've never seen a church like like that. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we begin to move together in your goodness, uh, in Jesus' name, everybody said amen. <clears throat> you know, I grew up, I didn't know nothing. I, I, I've never known any other church besides the Pentecostal church. I'm not saying that it's the only right church. I'm not saying that, that it's the only theological right church because there's a, a lot of great good Baptist men that I have uh, met that I've talked to that, that, that is absolutely on fire for God. There, there's been a lot of Methodist uh, preachers and, 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 and men that I've known. And I'll say there's even been some Catholics that I've known in my life who's really read the Word of God and understand the Word of God. But all I've ever known ever in my life is a Pentecostal movement. And sometimes what we can get into is we can say, well, we're Pentecostal. Well, why are you Pentecostal? Well, I'm Pentecostal because I shout real loud. I'm Pentecostal because I say, amen, preacher, preach. Or I'm Pentecostal because all I give in the offering is pennies. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Pentecost was a feast. And they get that term Pentecost because it was a feast. The Bible said that on the day of Pentecost that the Spirit of God fully came. And it began to move. Now, the Holy Ghost is not something that, that just existed uh, after Jesus left, but the Holy Ghost has always been here. He, he is a person. He is the third Godhead. And he's always been here even since the day of creation. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth. Now, y'all have heard me say this, that it hovered. 
That word hovered means to brew. It means to set. It means to wait until something is ready. And the Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the earth, and it brewed until everything in the earth become exactly what God wanted it to become. And so the Spirit of God has been here even throughout the, uh, the, the times we see where Samson would shake himself. And the Bible said that the Spirit of God would move upon him. Now, it was very strange to see Samson do some of the things that Samson did because in one part of the Scripture it said that Samson went in and took a 1,000 foxes and tied their tails together. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't even catch one fox <laughs> besides a 1,000. Said so, so that right there, you can stop right there. That's a miracle, bro. He caught him with his hand. <laughs> That's a bad dude. Caught a thousand foxes and tied their tails together and lit their tails on fire and they burned up the, uh, uh, the, 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 the harvest of the Philistines. And the Bible said that, that the Spirit of God would move upon Samson that at one time he went up to the, uh, down to the gate, the city of Gaza, and picked up the gate post uh, up upon his shoulders uh, and carried it five miles up a hill and set it down. Now, what really made it strange was Samson was about my size. He didn't, he didn't uh, turn green. He was just a normal man, but when the Spirit of God came upon him, things happened and things changed. And that's what made it stand out. They didn't know what it was. They wanted Delilah to find out what is it about Samson that causes him to do this. And so the Bible said that Delilah enticed him. Now, most people read the, the, the story of Samson and Delilah, and they say, yeah, old Delilah, yeah, she wore red lipstick and a red dress, and she's a swinging her hips. <laughs> and nowhere in the Bible does it give a description of Delilah like that. It's just that his, he, 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 he was already heartbroken uh, over the woman that had died that he loved. Uh, and he was heartbroken and he was mad and he was full of envy and he was full of hurt. Uh, almost sounds like a generation we're living in today. Uh, almost everybody's got a problem. Everybody's mad at somebody. Somebody did me wrong. Uh, and all, 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 all of a sudden we're blaming everybody else uh, for our own faults and we're sitting back and we're setting ourselves up. Uh, and revival is wanting to move upon us. Uh, but we're dealing with issues uh, and we want won't get to the root of it or to the problem of it and we come to church and we sing our songs and we go through the motions. Come on, somebody. Don't sit on me now. And we go through the motions and we go through all of these things going on, but we don't dive in to what God really wants us to do. So the Bible said that Samson would shake himself when he would shake himself, that the Spirit of God would come upon him and a supernatural strength that, 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 that cannot be explained by nobody else would happen to Samson. Until one day, that Delilah wanted to know what is the secret. What is it that makes you the man that you are? Oh, I can't tell you that. It's a family secret way down the line. Kind of like a little girl goes up to her mom and says, Mom, every time you cook Thanksgiving dinner, why do you cut the ends of the ham off? She says, I don't know, honey. You're going to have to go ask your, ask your grandmama because she's always did it and because she did it, I did it. So she goes to grandma and says, Grandma, when you cut the uh, Thanksgiving dinner, why do you always cut the ends of the ham off? Well, duh. I don't know. You're going to have to go ask your great-grandmama because she always did it, and so I did it. So she go ask great-grandma. Great-grandma sitting in her rocker chair. She's old. She can't hardly move. And she's sitting back. She's rocking. She said, uh, great-grandma, why do you always cut the ends of the ham off when you cook it? She said, oh, child, uh, it's because my pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> and we... And we start doing traditions on down, on down, on down. And it gets on down and the church is just full of everybody. Come on, somebody. And, then, and we start doing what everybody else is doing and hadn't figured out why. But I need to tell you that this generation is different. They ain't nobody ever seen a worshiper like you. They ain't nobody ever seen you cry out to God like you're going to cry out. Nobody has ever seen it. Samson would shake himself, and, and, so, and so one day, 
after, after the Bible said that, that Delilah was paid to come in and entice him. As he began to lay in the lap of Delilah and she began to entice him and she began to tell him, you don't really love me. If you really love me, you would tell me what it is. Oh, you can take a, 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 a strands and you can tie it around me. And, 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 and when you do, it takes away my strength. And, so, and so, so she took while he was asleep and she tied strands around him and she jumped and she said, the Philistines are upon you. And poof, he broke them and jumped up and she said, oh, you just, you just really don't love me. Till one day he broke down. Listen to me, I'm getting somewhere. Till one day he broke down. And he said, I need to tell you something. He said, from the womb of my mother, I've been a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite was not something that you was born into. It was a vow that you had to take. It was a vow that you took upon your life. That's why they called him the Nazarene. It was a vow that you had to take upon your life that, that, that there's certain foods that you will not eat. There's certain uh, uh, things that you won't drink. You won't drink wine. You, you, you won't eat uh, 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 certain meats. And you won't touch any dead thing. And Samson messed it all up all through his life. You can see the grace of God as he took the jawbone of a donkey and slew a, a, a thousand men with it. As he began to move through, he, he is breaking everything. But because of that vow, listen to me, but because because of that vow, God's still moving on his life. I need to tell somebody right now, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what's going on in your life. That when you begin to move in God and that vow comes on, I don't care. Other people can point their finger and all they ever know you by is a man who robbed the liquor store. It's a girl who got pregnant in high school. But can I tell you that, my God, when that vow comes in your life, I don't care what prison cell you're in. I don't care what what junkyard you're in. I don't care what dope goes in your vein. I'm here to tell you right now that the power of God ah, will move into your life and pull you out. It'll pull you out of it. And others will be sitting there thinking, well, they ain't changed. Honey, you ain't living for them anyhow. You're living for him. And it don't matter what anybody else says. What matters is it moved on you. One day, he said, I got seven locks of hair for the seven vows that I made to God. So to keep my vows, I put my hair in seven different locks that every day I would get up and I would look at myself and remind myself of the vow I made to God. So she caught him asleep. Listen to me, church. It ain't time to sleep. If there's ever a time to be awake, it's now. It ain't time to sleep. So he got comfortable and went to sleep. She shaved his head. I don't know about you. Somebody shaved my head. <laughs> Everybody say, I love the preacher. I mean, I must have been drinking Mad Dog 2020 or something because, I mean, uh, you shave my head, I'm going to feel it. My wife likes to get me down the road. Sometimes we down the down road, she looks at me and she goes, you got one eyebrow, I need to get it. And one day I said, okay. And she read, she, boom, I, I about wrecked. Started watering my eyes. And I said, my God, you're trying to kill us all. <laughs> We're driving down the road the other day and Cody looked at me and said, man, you got a long eyebrow. I said, leave it alone. He said, it's bugging me. I said, it's my antenna to talk to God. Leave it alone. <laughs> then I looked in the mirror, and I thought, oh, wow. And I tried to pull on it. So I stopped. She shaved his head, and she jumped up, and she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. 
Listen, this is the most scariest verse in the Bible that you'll ever read. He got up and shook himself and didn't even know that God left him. Come to church and didn't even know the anointing wasn't there. Oh, come on, somebody. Come to church and didn't even know that the presence of God wasn't there because you got so used to doing what you did. You got so used to singing the songs. You got so used to amening. You got so used to hallelujah. You got so used to giving in the offering. You come to church all those years and didn't even know that the spirit of God had left. I'm telling you what, there's a revival that's waking the church up. It is coming and it is brutal. It is coming with a vengeance. It is to kick devils and take names and wake the slumbering, sleeping church up. It's time to wake up. It's time to know that revival is upon us. <laughs> Jesus said, tells a parable. A man had a vineyard. He said, I got to get this vineyard done. So he goes out and he hires people in his vineyard. When the third hour came, he said, Man, if I don't hire more people, I'm not going to get it done. So he goes out and he sees men setting idle, and he hires them. I will give you a penny to work for me. So they go into the vineyard, and they work. He comes back out at six hour, and he looks, and he thinks, man, this is a lot of work. I need more people. So he goes out, and he hires more people And at the sixth hour and says, I'll give you a penny if you will come to the vineyard and work. So he comes back and he looks and he thinks, man, there's still more work to be done. I need more workers. And so he goes out at the ninth hour and he hires them. I'll give you a penny to come and work. And so they come and work. And he comes back up on the last hour just before it's over with. And he looks and he thinks, you know what? This ain't enough men to finish it. There's still so much work to be done. I've got to get this done. So I need to hire more men. And he goes out and he sees men standing idle. And he says, I will give you a penny. If you will come and work for me for this one hour that I have left. And they come in and they go to work. And so when it's all over with, they come to get paid. And so, and so he says, I need the ones who started last. I need to pay them now. Listen, listen. This is what God is telling us. He's telling us that the last generation is the most important. Listen, I know all the others before us. I know, praise God, that Adam was a very important man. I, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you what. Uh, one preacher said it like this. Uh, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to find Adam. Uh, and somebody said, well, don't you want to see Jesus? Uh, he said, no, uh, I'm going to find Adam and hit him right in the mouth for all the hell uh, he made me have to go through down here on earth. Uh, I'm mad at him, praise God. Uh, and, 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 and so I, I know Adam's important. Uh, I know Abraham's important because the Jew didn't start uh, until Abraham. I know that Noah was very important because God wanted to start with another generation. My God, you can see the pattern all over that the first generation was good, but he needed another generation. I know that all those things are important, but I'm telling you right now, you may think that you don't know enough church, you don't know enough scripture, but God is coming out at the 11th hour, and he's telling you, I don't need to know how long you've been raised. I don't need to know your theology. I don't need to know if you're a Baptist, if you're a Methodist, and it's Baptist Coastal, praise God. But I don't need to know any of that thing. What I need to know is are you ready to work? Yeah. He's looking at a generation that hasn't been church, but's been converted. Listen to me, there's a lot of people that says they're saved. There's a lot of people that says they're saved. But have you been converted? See, see, the Bible says that when the apostle Paul, he didn't get saved. The Bible says he got converted. Because when conversion begins to move, Jesus talks to me, and I'm going to get to my uh, rest description in just a minute, but I, I, I've been too long with God uh, today. I just got to get it out of me. I'm going to blow up. Praise God. So, so, so Jesus talks to Peter, and this is what he says. He says, he, he, he says, he, he, he said, he says, Peter, he said, I want you to know that Satan, Satan has desired to have you, and he wants to sift you like wheat. Peter, I want you to know 
that I'm praying for you, listen to me, that your faith fail you not. Listen, listen, here it comes. But when you are converted, listen, he knew Peter was going to deny him, but he still, yeah, here's the whole deal about it. He knew Peter was going to deny him, but here's the whole deal. He said, but I'm praying for you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. When Jesus is praying for you, honey, you can lay it down and hang it up because you know it's a done deal. And so Peter walks up and he denies Jesus the first time and the second time, and then he curses and denies him. Some people say, well, old Peter, you know, them, them, them old preachers, you say it like this. Old Peter, man, he'd cuss you, cut you, and then pray for you. <laughs> he cut a man's ear off. And they take, well, he cursed. Well, they didn't have cuss words like we do. He, I, I, I'm sure he didn't take God's name in vain that they didn't do that. But when he said he cursed God, this is what he was saying. That Peter said, I want you to take me out of the Jewish history. I denounce my Jewish uh, a, a place that I'm standing at, and I want you to take me out of it. He cursed himself out of it. I walk away from it. I denounce it. So when the cock crowed, Peter knew what he did. He went out, and he began to weep and cry. Because the only man, because, because when you cursed and you got out, the Bible in the law says uh, that the only way you can get back in is if the, the priest at the residing time put you back in. And the man that put him in just died. So he knew his life was over. I just cursed and got myself out, and the only one that can put me back in just died on the tree. So he's weeping. He's weeping. So yeah, when they come and told Peter, hey, Jesus is alive. He's about 40 years old. Don't you know that old man took off running? Oh, I know he did because the Bible said he did. But the younger man, John, was faster than him because he's about 23 at the time. Peter was about 40. And John out running and come to the tomb. And when he got to the tomb, Peter stopped and John ran in. And Peter looked in just to see. When he saw there was an empty grave, <laughs> I'm just going to do it my style because I'm preaching. <laughs> ah, he said there's hope after all. He didn't die. He's alive. He's alive. There's hope after all. I can be renewed. I can be renewed into the kingdom. So when I tell you that he's alive, I want you to know I don't care what sins you've ever committed. I'm telling you that because he lives, you can live also. Done went two minutes past my eight o'clock. <laughs> he went out when he began to pay them. The Bible says that one that had been in the hot sun all day began to murmur and gripe and complain. They said, Listen, we don't care if you pay them. But they should not get what we got. Because we've been doing it longer. We've endured the heat. We've endured everything all day long. And these jokers walk up here for an hour. And you give them the same money. Now, you hired a walker to go out on that excavator? I'm going to tell you, and he works all day. And then you tell Lance, Lance, come out and work for me. And you give Lance the same money you give Walker. Walker's not going to say, good job, Lance. No, he's not. You're probably going to have to get Walker saved again. <laughs> Every one of us knows that that's exactly how we would become. But it doesn't stop Christ because he already knows what he's going to do. Because he already knows that the 11th hour generation come in. 
right at the time when he needed the most. So I'm telling you right now that you're not out of time and you're not out of place. You got saved right in time. You got saved from everything in your life right on time. You are a right on time generation. God has moved in your life. You are right on time. Everything God's going to do, he's going to do it right on time and in your life. Now, listen, I'm not done yet. Just hang on. I'm coming to a close. I really am. When I look in the Bible, I see that there's a third hour. And I read there's a sixth hour. And I read that there's a ninth hour. But the eleventh hour is a mystery. Because I don't see it nowhere else in Scripture except when Jesus begins to talk about it right here. See, the third hour of the day... I read that it was actually an outpouring because the Bible says in the book of Acts that at the third hour of the day, which had been 9 o'clock to us, but to Jewish history because it started at 6, at the third hour of the day that the Holy Ghost opened up and there was an outpouring. Now I read at the sixth hour because it said that when Peter and John stumbled upon the temple of beautiful at the sixth hour of the day, that there was a lame man, lame upon his feet, that he'd been laid all of his life. And they looked upon him, and he's, he began to move that little jingle box and said, will you give unto me? They said, silver and gold have I none, but as I have, I give unto thee. He said, look upon me. Peter didn't say, look who I am. Look where I came from. He said, look into my eyes. Look upon me. As he fastened his eyes upon him, the Bible said that he said, rise up and walk. And he received strength in his ankle bones. And he got up and began began to run. He ran into the temple, dancing and shouting. And everybody that was in the temple looked at him and said, dude, what are you doing? He said, "You don't you know me? I'm the lame man outside. And they looked at him like, what are you doing in here? He said, because I got healed, praise God. I ain't lame no more. I got healed. There was miracles. I read at the ninth hour, Jesus said, I must go into Samaria. And he goes and stands at a well to wait on a woman. And he says, the hour has come when the true worshipers. Now listen, listen, I'm going somewhere. The third hour was outpouring. The sixth hour was miracle. And the ninth hour was the true worship. So the 11th hour, this is why they're so mad. Come on, somebody. This is why they're so mad. Just, just, just go home and call somebody who ain't saved and say, nana, nana, boo, boo. <laughs> just hang the phone up. <laughs> What's going to happen, pre- preacher? Oh, they're going to tweet about you. Them people down there light churches ain't nothing but a bunch of tweakers, man. They call me at 11 o'clock at night and then the boo boo. I wonder what they're on. <laughs> Just don't tell them I told you to do it. Tell them Anna told you to do it. <laughs> so the 11th hour is a mystery that's never been talked about until Jesus begins to talk about it. And he says, I know they come in first, but the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And there was a power in the second that the Bible said that when Jacob was born and Esau was first, that the Bible said Jacob grabbed a hold of his heel. And he, as he come out, he was a heel grabber. But the Bible said that the blessing went unto the second, which is Jacob. The Bible said that Manasseh and Ephraim, that as they was born of Joseph, he took them to Jacob at an old age. And Jacob began to move because Manasseh was the oldest one. The Bible said he crossed his hands and he blessed the second one before my God, I'm about to 
out. He blessed the second one before he did the first. So there's power in the second. And if Adam was first and Jesus is the second Adam, my God, if the first covenant was good, but the second covenant is better, then don't you know that there's power in the second? I'm about to run all over this place. Don't mess with me. I'll jack it up and do revival about two weeks. <laughs> Woo. So he says something in here, and he begins to demonstrate by how this revival is touching a generation that nobody ever thought was going to get in. This same generation was hanging out when the third hour people came. They was hanging out when the sixth hour people came. They was hanging out when the ninth hour people came. But he still went out and he found more that was hanging out. And he said, I need you to work in my vineyard. The Bible says in the book of Haggai chapter 2, verse number 6. For this saith the Lord of hosts, yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with the glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter, which is the second, shall be greater than the former, which is the first, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So what's going to happen is he's going to take the first glory and he's going to take the second glory and they're going to collide. There's going to be a collision. And when they hit, everything inside of them is just going to go. <laughs> it's just going to hit. So this is what he said I'm going to do with the 11th hour. And come to the piano, please. This is what I'm going to do with the 11th hour generation. He says, I'm going to take the outpouring. I'm going to take the miracles. And I'm going to take the worship. And I'm going to put it all together. <laughs> come on, somebody. They ain't no other generation ever had a glory like this. He said, I'm going to take the outpouring. I'm going to take the miracles. And I'm going to take the true worshipers. I'm going to mix it up. It's going to collide. And this generation is going to know that what I have put upon their life, they're going to have an outpouring. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and upon my hands, Handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in the last in the last days, saith God. He said, I'm gonna do a demonstration that nobody has ever seen. You are gonna be a church that nobody has ever seen. Now, all oh, preacher, you all mixed up. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. <clears throat> Praise God. The Bible says, and there will come a time when I will shake everything that can be shaken. Huh? You thought Elvis Presley was all shook up, honey. You ain't seen what's about to happen to this church. Honey, let me tell you something. You ain't seen. Whew. No blue suede shoes going to stop anybody. I'm telling you right now, it is going to move. Ain't nothing but a hound dog. I don't know why I'm saying all that, but praise God. It's going to move. And it's going to move into the church. And the church has never seen a church like us. Let me tell you. Let me just tell you. It's never seen a church like us. It's never seen a mixed up people. It's never seen a drug addict get completely off of dope. It's never seen an alcoholic become clean. It's never seen a gay become straight. Come on, somebody. It's time that this generation of believers, they get the outpouring, they get the healing, and they get the worship. Oil Roberts, there's a book on Oil Roberts talking about his greatest miracles. One of the greatest miracles I read in there, he said he, said he was in the Ohio Valley. He was praying. He said there were so many people. He said there was about 10,000 people. And he said we'd have revivals 
I mean, we'd have a revival every night, and there'd be so many people to come that we'd have to take from A, B, C, who, who, who's ever name, last name started, A, B, C, put them in the prayer line and pray for them because it took so long. And so then the next night, they would go D, E, F, whoever's last name started with D, E, F. They would go through that. There would be so many people. And they would come up and said one, one miracle in particular. He said this woman come up, and she had this little child. When she come up, this little child was kind of standing uh, 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 funny. And so he looked down and saw this little child, this, 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 this little girl, and said that she was standing up, and one leg was just dangling. And he said, hey, get that uh, girl a chair. So they got the girl a chair. So he looked at the mom, and he said, he said, mama, what do you need? And she said, well, my daughter was born. And she said that she don't have any bones from her knee down. It didn't grow. So old Robert said that he took the little child's leg, Said he bent it up plumb like a pretzel all the way back and said he took it and just shook it. It just it just just flesh, it just shook. There was no bone in it at all. But it was a complete leg, a complete foot, complete toe, everything, but no bone. He said he looked at the little girl and he looked at the mama and he said, Mama, I'm sorry, but I don't have enough faith to believe for this. That mama looked at him and said, Oh Roberts. You just got through preaching that God can do anything. I'm not asking you to do anything. I want you to just pray. Get that believer's life. I just need you to pray. Well, Robert said, he said, yes, ma'am. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll do the praying and you do the believing. She said, okay. He started praying. Oh, Lord. Thou wonderful God that created everything. We are nothing but we come to you and we ask you because you can do anything. God, that you would touch this little girl, Lord, that's going to take a creative miracle. I've only read about it, but I've never experienced it. But I'm standing here today, and this woman has the faith to have it done. All of a sudden, that little girl says, Mama, Mama, Mama says, Honey, be quiet. Oral's praying. The organ player said, I heard bones crack. She said, look down, and that little girl looked down. She said, Mama, she said, honey, Oral's praying. Mama, but look, there's a bone in my leg. And the mama started screaming, and Oral jumped up, and he looked. And he said, I can tell you right now, that's one that I don't even have faith for. But can I tell you right now, that's because he was in the season of miracles. I need to tell every one of you right now that when the worship comes and when the outpouring comes, so does a miracle. So does the miracles. COVID-19, you're a devil from hell, and we come against you in the name of Jesus. Listen to me, not only are we going to get the outpouring, we're going to get the miracles and we're going to get the true worship. We ain't never worship God like we're going to worship him. You think coming to church and raise your hand because the preacher stands up here and says, everybody raise your hands and let's praise him. You, 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 you think that the true worshiper is going to be, more, no, 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 no. What they're going to do is they're going to get it and they're going to run and they don't need nobody to act them on, but they're going to worship. They're going to fall in love with God and the true worshipers are going to come and you're not only going to see it in church, but you're going to drive down the road and look over and you're going to see somebody raising their hands and just walking down Broadway and praising God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You're going to walk in Walmart, and when you walk up, it's not going to be somebody from China. It's going to be your neighbor talking in tongues. In another language, there's an outpouring that's coming. God is messing you up. He's taking everything you ever thought you know about him, and he's taking the former glory and the latter glory. It's colliding, and this generation will get it. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet all over this building. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, no one looking around. Just for a minute, would you? <clears throat> Could I get some water? Anybody, please? Consuming fire 
Hallelujah. 